Welcome to the audio lecture series on the evolution of the afterlife from the Paleolithic to ancient Greece. What I want to do in this lecture series is to walk the listener through uh, the evolution of the afterlife beginning with the earliest evidence for burials in the Paleolithic and on through the Neolithic down through the Bronze Age and the emergence of the first cities in both Mesopotamia and Egypt and continue on across through India, China and Mesoamerica and then come back uh, across the water to ancient Greece is to show uh, how changing ideas about the afterlife have affected the rate of technological and cultural development. And what I want to do is sort of propose that there's an inverse relationship between the degree to which the afterlife and respect for the dead and the ancestors hangs heavy over a particular society and the rate of the pace of change of technological development in that society, namely that the heavier the cult of the ancestors is on a society, the slower will be the pace of its technological change. Uh, and I think we'll see how this plays out in where we're at in the West. And this leads me to ask, what I'd like to do is start with the first question, which is to say that of all the civilizations in, 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 uh, in ancient history, uh, what I want to ask is why it is that the West's Day of the Dead, namely Halloween, is the shortest of all the ancient civilizations. Even the Mexican Day of the Day of the Dead is uh, two days, and one ideally in that tradition goes out to spend the night in the cemetery with the dead relatives, and then come back the next day. So, uh, and this is a tradition that the Mexican uh, that the Mexican society has inherited from the Aztecs. And note the difference that in that case one goes out to visit the dead, uh, whereas in the West the dead come to see us in our houses. And the idea, of course, is that our children are dressed up. Uh, not ideally like Spider-Man or Superman or Batman or anything of that sort. The original idea is that they are meant to dress up to represent the ancestral dead who reappear at one's doorstep and they're asking for a treat as a means of making them go away. So uh, the idea is that the dead come back and they trouble us, they trouble one's conscience unless one gives them an offering and traditionally in ancient civilization the offering would have been something like you know one's best goat for example or one's uh, an excellent cow or a bull or something like that that would have been offered to them or in worst case scenario some some blood even human blood in some cases uh, to offer to the dead to make them go away and so now we've, we've just shrunken it down to a couple of candy bars on Halloween to make the dead go away uh, and it's the shortest of all the days of the dead it occupies only really not even a full day a couple of hours at night uh, it's not even a paid holiday and in all the, by contrast, in all the ancient civilizations, for the Mesopotamians, they set aside one day each month for the so-called Kishpu uh, celebration, which was held on the dark of the moon, the new moon, every month, where at the dinner table one would set a place for the departed and would recognize them in that, in that manner. And that happened once a month. The Egyptians, likewise, had the beautiful Feast of the Valley, which lasted for several days in the middle of the month of April. And even the Greeks, uh, who, as we will see, were really the first civilization to turn away from the elders and the cult of the dead and to shift and replace what I call the wonder child in as the central object of religious fetish. And that begins with Achilles in the Iliad and the great Kouros cults that were the inspiration for the statuary there in that tradition. Even the Greeks uh, had a couple of festivals at two different times of the year, namely the Anthesteria, which was celebrated on the 11th through the 13th of the month, Anthesterion, in the springtime. And then later in the year, the Genesia, which was celebrated at Athens on the 5th of Bedromian uh, in September, October. So even they had uh, the culture that began this process in the West of turning away from the dead, away from the elders, and deferring toward the cult of the youth and the wonder child. Uh, because the West ever since has really been turned, has really been oriented toward change and the new and the different and away from the conservation of tradition, which is represented by both the, the living elders on the one hand and the dead um, on the other. So that's what I want to look at. First, what I'd like to do is, uh, is there some way in which we can look back at history and find a specific text uh, where this tradition of turning away from the elders and toward the youth first appears? And I think that the earliest text for that is a text, a, a sort of extra canonical Gilgamesh text. It doesn't appear in the Gilgamesh epic, the standard Babylonian version of it. Uh, this text is known as Gilgamesh and Akka. And in this text, Akka was the son of Enmabarak Gezi, who was the ruler of a city in ancient Mesopotamia about 2600 BC, at the time when the real historical Gilgamesh lived and ruled in the city of Uruk. Uh, Enmabarak Gezi and his son Akka ruled in the city of Kish. And Kish was at this time at war with Uruk. 
And Gilgamesh goes to the Council of the Elders in this sto story, and he asks them if they want to go to war against Kish, or should they submit? Uh, and the elders advise Gilgamesh to submit to the yoke of Kish. Gilgamesh overrides their wishes, though, and turns to all the youth in the city, and he asks them if they want to go to war against Akka or not, and they unanimously vote to go to war against Akka and the city of Kish, which they then indeed do, and they conquer Kish, and so Kish ends up having to submit to the rule of a rook. Um, that's the earliest text where we find this tradition of deferring to the youth and beginning the process in civilization of turning away from the elders uh, and the cult of the, the elders and the past and the ancestors. And um, in the West, of course, the earliest apparition of, of the wonder child is Achilles in the Iliad, which is an epic which opens up with a conflict between Agamemnon, who is a old, grizzled, middle-aged warrior representing the old guard and the old tradition, the, the great Mycenaean age that Homer is paying farewell to in that epic, uh, and his conflict with Achilles, who is the youngest hero in the epic, over uh, this girl named Briseis, but it really isn't a conflict over the girl. What it is is a conflict between the wonder child, of whom Achilles is the first apparition in the West here. Uh, this text is written in the middle of the 8th century BC and the cult of the elders, which is represented by Agamemnon, the older man that Achilles uh, refuses to defer to. And Achilles is, uh, as Carolyn Alexander has argued in her book on the death of Achilles, apparently a late addition to the epic. Uh, we can tell this from the fact that uh, most of the action of the book takes place without him in it. He spends most of his time sulking inside of his tent. He's out of the action, and he alone among the warriors would have been too young. He was only about 20 years old at the time that the epic is written, but they've been fighting at Troy for 10 years when the epic op opens up. So he alone among these warriors would have been too young to make the vow to go and rescue Helen if she was ever abducted by the Trojans. So he couldn't have made that, that vow at, at 10 years of age. He would have been too young. Uh, but he is the earliest appearance of the Wonder Child, and after him, of course, comes the great uh, Greek statuary with the Kouros, the young boy who is the primary inspiration of the statuary. It's connected with a funerary cult, this is true, but these are also the ideal images, the young boy here. And you find no old men really depicted in uh, Greek statuary until the Hellenistic phase when it's beginning to decline and, and lose its, its basic rise on detra. So uh, the Greeks represent the beginning of the whole turning away from the cult of, of the elders and the conservation and respect for tradition, turning toward the new, turning toward change and transformation. Uh, and really, if you look at the evolution of the God idea in the West, our idea of God has actually undergone uh, reverse uh, aging. Um, if you look at the shift, just like in uh, David Fincher's movie, uh, Benjamin Button, where the main character there um, begins as an old man and slowly be becomes young, that's really what's happened in the West. We started with Yahweh in the Old Testament, the great grizzled old man. Then we moved to the New Testament with Christ, the 30-year-old man. He's 33 years old when he's crucified. Two, in the medieval period, around 1200 AD, with the Mary cults, the, the emphasis shifts to the Christ infant on her lap, which becomes the new revelation. You see the Christ child turning up in that art more so than ever before because he represents the future. The child is the future. He points the way toward the future. And the West, beginning with the cult of the Mary, Mary and the Christ child here at this time, begins to orient itself toward the future, toward the new, toward change, toward novelty. And as the result, this has fueled our desire for technological transformation ever since. We love the new thing, and the old thing is what we do not value anymore. And so correspondingly, this goes along with our devaluation of the elders. We don't regard our senior citizens as elders, but as elderly, and we put them away in institutions out of sight. Uh, they're not regarded as oracles <clears throat> or as any way uh, sources of wisdom. We don't go to them. We go to the, nung, the, the new young 20-year-old, the you know, Steve Jobs type character who's got the new thing, the new gadget that he's working on in his garage that's going to change the society for the rest of us, to which we will all have to catch up and adapt. So we're always running after the wonder child and his new inventions. And it all comes out of this change, this series of transformations that we're going to review in this series of what happened to the cult of the dead over time. Now, if we contrast the Asiatic attitude, if we contrast, let's say, Gilgamesh and Akka with the story of Monkey, as it's told in the Chinese novel Journey to the West. What we find there is that Monkey represents in that tradition the principle of individuality, uh, and he is reckless, and individuality there is regarded as anarchic, and Monkey personifies this. 
He steals from the Dragon King, the Great Scepter, that was once used to carve out the constellations in the heavens. And uh, he steals from Lao Tzu the Elixir of Immortality. Um, he tries to fly to the farthest edges of the cosmos. He does all of these feats and things, and, and the gods, he upsets the whole cosmic order and the whole cosmic balance, um, and he can't be brought under control, so they call in the Buddha. And the Buddha comes to him and tells him that if he can fly to the farthest edges of the cosmos, then the Buddha will ask the Jade Emperor to step aside and allow Monkey to take his place, which is what Monkey really wants. So Monkey agrees, and he summons his pink cloud and flies off to the five pillars at the edges of the universe, on each one of which he writes graffiti that says, Monkey was here. When he returns to the Buddha, the Buddha then tells him that uh, the monkey had never even left his hand, for those five pillars were actually the Buddha's five fingers. Uh, and he shows Monkey the graffiti on one of his fingers. So Monkey is immediately then placed under a rock and a mountain, where he has to await the coming of the sage, whose guide he will become on the way to India in order to retrieve some Yogacara Buddhist texts. Uh, and the sage then uh, will only be able to control Monkey by placing a band around his head that he magically tightens any time Monkey starts to become unruly. That shows the attitude toward the principle of individuality, which is linked in here with the, the, um, with the condemnation of the cult of the wonder child, basically the, the unruly youth, uh, the Achilles figure who in the Iliad really corresponds to Monkey in the sense that he cannot be brought under control and will not submit to the yoke of Agamemnon, whereas Monkey ultimately is brought under control and has to submit to the cosmic order. You can see the difference in the two traditions there. It becomes very glaringly evident. Um, so what I want to do then is, um, as we look through history, uh, there are going to be a number of key transformation points that we're going to encounter, which I want to call uh, creative singularities, which tend to occur at the same time as a mortuary rupture takes place. And a mortuary rupture, uh, I'm going to define as a weakening in the mortuary practices or a weakening in the cult of reverence for the ancestral dead or a temporary reorganization of that cult. And when that weakening happens, Invariably, we can see it happening historically in tandem with a sudden technological acceleration. Periods of rapid change, or to put it in Peter Sloterdijk's terms, of spherological breakdown are periods when uh, the axial orientation to the dead disintegrates and uh, is undergoing a process of reconfiguration, and technology bursts through that opening and begins to advance, and the whole society then has to, has to change and adapt and catch up. The earliest of these, of course, was the Paleolithic Singularity, about 35,000 BC. And it's in just this period that we find hardly any burials of the Cro-Magnon dead in Western Europe at just the time when all these new technologies are pro proliferating, such as bone working, the tailoring of skins to make clothes. We get new kinds of tools like burins and awls and needles, new musical instruments such as flutes, along with the earliest art. This is the time of the, the art of the cave of Chauvet, 33,000 BC. The earliest Venus figurine, the Venus of Holofels, was found and dates to about 37,000 years ago. Uh, whereas Neanderthals during this period, they continue burying the dead. And the Neanderthals represent uh, the period of conservation. They are the cults of the elders and their reverence for the dead is very strong. And they continue with their traditions of conservation while the Cro-Magnons bring in this brand new cult of change and uh, the earliest origins, really, of the Wonder Child, and uh, they actually end up obsolescing the Neanderthals completely, who within a mere 12,000 or so years disappear from the stage of European history. The next such rupture we find, or we will find as we look through uh, history here, will be the Pottery Neolithic Singularity, which doesn't occur until all the way down to about 6500 BC to about 5500 BC, <clears throat> which is just at the time when the Skull Cult, the skull cult, which had originated, actually, as we'll see with the Neanderthals, begins to weaken and disappear. Uh, it had been the, the primary form of religiosity, and the skull cult is the primary means of keeping the dead around because most of these skulls are kept inside the houses, and they're used almost like radios for transmitting messages to uh, the revered dead who are kept very cozy and they're well integrated into the society during the so-called pre-pottery Neolithic that lasts from roughly, you know, uh, 10,000 BC all the way down to 6,500. Uh, and at just this time, we get start getting in the pottery Neolithic all these new technologies, such as new types of kilns for firing new types of more sophisticated pottery. We begin to get metallurgy. We begin to get cremation of the dead, new mortuary practices. All of this starts happening right about this time here, which is a transitional period that paves the way for the emergence of civilization. And indeed, the next period of uh, a great creative singularity is, of course, 
the Arukian singularity in which the city of Uruk comes into being 3500 BC together with